This week's lab covers the topics of torque and work, and the relevant Saxon physics lessons are lessons 9 and 12. So you may want to have your textbook around so you can refer back to those lessons in case you need to when you're doing any calculations. To investigate torque, we'll just do an experiment. And if you look at your lab sheet, hopefully you've printed your lab assignment out already. You can see there that your materials are a fulcrum, a mass set, and mass hangers. Well, here in this picture, here's the fulcrum. It's this system here with this ruler on it. And you can see there's a centimeter scale on this ruler. And then, actually, there's supposed to be a pin that goes in right there. It's just not in this particular picture. There's a hole in this ruler that a pin goes through, and it will pivot at that point. That's your fulcrum point. And then there's just a plate down here to help support everything. These are the mass hangers. These devices right here, you just hook those onto the ruler, and then you can do these different weights, whichever ones you need for whichever experiment you're doing. To investigate torque, we'll basically do three different tests, one where we have two equal masses placed on different sides, and then another one with two different masses, and then a third with one mass on one side and two on the other. For each test, what you will do is determine the position that you need to place one of those masses in order to balance the system, and then you'll use your sum of moments formula to theoretically calculate the position that that mass should have been placed at. You'll compare your theoretical to experimental to get a percent error. So in the first experiment, with two equal masses, you're supposed to place a 20 gram mass, 20 centimeters from the fulcrum, and then place another 20 gram mass on the other side to balance the system. Here's a video of a student doing this experiment, and they weren't using 20 gram masses. It looks like they were using 200 gram masses, but it doesn't really matter that much as long as they're the same. Now, if you understand torque in moments, remember you kind of use those words interchangeably, it's pretty obvious that you would, if you had two equal masses, you'd place the other one at about 20 centimeters from the fulcrum in order to get it to balance. Now, because of imperfections in the ruler or the masses, different reasons, it may not be exactly 20 centimeters. And as you can see here on the screen, there's the data for that particular experiment that I want you to use, 20.20 centimeters was the position that the other mass was placed in order to balance the system. So you have your data there from that particular experiment. The experimental distance was 20.20 centimeters. Next, what you need to do is calculate the theoretical value and then determine your percent error. So go ahead and pause the CD and figure out your theoretical and then turn it back on and I'll show you how to calculate it and you can see if you did it correctly or not. So on our first test we had two equal 20 gram masses. One of them was placed 20 centimeters from the fulcrum so we knew this distance from there to there was 20 centimeters. Then we placed the other to balance that and if we want to solve for that value for x, we've already calculated it experimentally, and in our experiment we determined it was 20.20 centimeters. So now let's do the theoretical calculation here. And sometimes we call this the law of moments, the sum of the moments equals zero. In physics, things that are called laws, scientific laws, we call them that because they work so well that we can just assume that this is the way it should be if there was no error involved. So think about your torques here, or your moments. To the left, you would have a negative or counterclockwise torque. And then to the right of the fulcrum, you'd have a positive torque. So thinking about that, we'd have minus 20 grams times 20 centimeters. Now, we don't have to change our mass to newtons. You can just leave it as grams. We don't have to change our distance to meters either. We're still doing a force times a distance. Since we're on the surface of the Earth, we can assume gravity is the same everywhere, so we can just basically factor gravity out. And then plus 20 grams times x equals zero. 
So just rearranging, trying to solve for x now, it's just a basic algebra equation. 20x equals 20 times 20. And the 20s cancel one of those 20s as a factor. x equals 20 centimeters. Now let's figure out our percent error for this experiment. And that's experimental minus theoretical. So our experimental was 20.20 minus theoretical divided by theoretical. And then all of that, you always multiply to get percent error or percent difference. Anytime you're calculating that, it's always a fraction that you're dealing with. You multiply that by 100 to convert it to percentage. And so that would just equal 1%. We had a 1% error on that experiment. And we would expect it to be pretty low. This experiment was pretty easy to set up. There's some minor errors just involved with the fulcrum itself. And maybe the ruler's not the same mass on both sides. Or maybe our mass hangers are different masses. Or those masses aren't exactly 20 grams. So there's always some error in any experiment. But here we can see the error was pretty low. Let's go on to the second test. This time we have two different masses. And you can see a picture here. And we wanted to place a 50 gram mass 34 centimeters from the fulcrum and then place a 100 gram mass on the other side to balance the system. So here's a picture of a balanced system with two different masses. The data for this one is 19.30 centimeters. That's the experimental distance that that 100, 100 gram mass was from the fulcrum point. Remember, you always measure these distances relative to the fulcrum. If you look on your lab worksheet, there's a hint there. It says, the hangers weigh 16 grams each. Now, what I'm trying to tell you there is you have to account for the hangers when you calculate your theoretical result and then compare that to the experimental. So go ahead and pause the CD, calculate your theoretical value for this experiment, and then get your percent error. Let's go ahead and calculate that theoretical distance that that 100 gram mass needs to be placed. And here we have our sum of moments already. I have it written down up there. I have the little design or diagram drawn. And it always helps to draw a diagram to help you think about what you're doing. And so we have minus 50 times 34 plus 100x equals 0. Let's just rearrange that. 100x equals 1,700. We divide both sides by 100x equals 17 centimeters. Now our experimental was 19.30 centimeters. That seems like that's quite a bit of difference there. And the reason for that is we did not account for the mass hangers. When you have different masses on the different sides, the mass hangers come into play because they are part of the mass and they are important in balancing the system. When you have equal masses on both sides, the mass hangers don't really matter because they're supposed to be the same mass anyway. Their masses just kind of cancel out. But when you have different masses, you have to account for them. So basically what we need to do is add 16 grams to our masses, and we have minus 66 times 34 plus 116 times x equals 0. Rearranging, we'll get 116x is equal to 2244. And x is equal to 19.34 centimeters. Let's get our percent error for this experiment. That would be experimental minus theoretical over theoretical. And those are really similar. So obviously, we're going to get a pretty small percent error. That result needs to be multiplied by 100%. Don't forget to do that. And you get 0.2% error. 
So our experimental and theoretical values agreed well in that experiment, especially after we accounted for the mass of the hangers. Let's go on to the third test. This one we had one mass on one side and two on the other. And here we were supposed to place a 200 gram mass 12 centimeters from the fulcrum. You can see that one hanging on the right of this particular photograph. And then on the left, placing a 100 gram mass 19 centimeters from the fulcrum, then a 20 gram mass to balance the system. For this one, that 20 gram mass was, had to be positioned at 11.02 centimeters. And just something to keep in mind here as far as significant figures, when you're using a ruler, you can always go one more place value than the tick marks or calibration marks on the ruler. For example, if you're measuring in centimeters, you know, in between each centimeter mark on that ruler, there are 10 millimeter marks. A millimeter is a tenth of a centimeter. And then you can guess or estimate one more place after that. So that would be the hundredths place. That's why I have the data to the hundredths place for these particular values. Now, don't forget the mass hangers, these hangers right here. They all weigh 16 grams, so go ahead and pause the CD, do your calculations, add those masses of the mass hangers in to get your correct theoretical value, and then compare that to the experimental to determine your percent error. So here's a diagram of that particular system, and we're solving for x, that distance the 20 gram mass is from the fulcrum. The 100 gram mass, that's 19 centimeters from there to there. And then here's x from the fulcrum to the 20 gram mass. Using the law of moments, I have the values there, minus 216. Remember, I added 16 grams for the hangers, the mass hangers. Minus 216 times 12 plus 36x plus 116 times 19. You set all of that equal to 0 and solve for x. And what I did first was just add the factors together, the minus 216 times 12 plus 116 times 19, and I got minus 388 plus 36x equals 0. You just rearrange that, you end up with 36x equals 388. And then divide both sides by 36, x is equal to 10 0.78 centimeters. Now our experimental we had was 11.02, so we do our percent error next. Experimental is 11.02 minus theoretical. That's 10.78 over the theoretical value 10.78. And remember, you always multiply all of that by 100%. It's just multiplying by 100 on your calculator is what you're doing. Make sure if you're doing this on a graphing calculator, the best thing to do is do this part first and put it in parentheses. And then do your division by 10.78. Hit your equal sign and get that answer. Then multiply by 100. And on this one, we had about 2.2% error. So again, a very low percent error. A lot of the experiments that we do, they're designed just to show you that the different physical laws that we're studying really do work. And one way we know that they really work is if we get a, a pretty low percent error. Sometimes we get a higher percent error if the experiment is not very easy to duplicate in a lab situation. But in this case, these experiments are easy to duplicate and we get a low percent error. Well, let's go on to the second part of this lab and look at work. And it's another application of force times distance, basically. When you're studying torque, you're multiplying a weight or a force times a distance. It's just that the distance is perpendicular to the force, basically. Work, you're pushing something and moving it a distance. Applying a force in the same direction as the motion, basically. So both torque and work, we're multiplying a force times a distance, but they have 
distinct differences in their applications. Here what we're going to do is follow the scientific method and answer a question. It's just kind of a unique way to study work, but the question here is, is a push-up the same for everyone? Maybe you've had to do a physical fitness test at one time and you were required to do 50 push-ups. And one thing I want you to see here is while everyone should be held to the same standard on a test like that, one person's 50 push-ups may be different than another person's 50 push-ups. So if you look at your lab procedure, well first you have the materials there, bathroom scale, stopwatch, and tape measure. But in the procedure it says first to determine the amount of work required for you to do one push-up. And you can do this at home too if you want to and you can just fill in that data there. First you place your hands on a bathroom scale in a position that you would naturally use when starting to do push-ups, kind of like in the picture there on the screen. Record the force applied to the bathroom scale and convert that force to newtons. And I give you a conversion there, 2.2 pounds per kilogram. So you would take, get your force in pounds off of the bathroom scale, divide that by 2.2, and then that would give you kilograms. You have to multiply that answer by 9.81 to obtain newtons. And then next it says, while in your starting push-up position, have someone measure the vertical distance from your nose while looking down to the ground. That distance must, that's the distance you must move to complete one push-up. So again, look at that picture there. There's somebody has a ruler there, they're measuring that distance from that student's nose to the ground and that's usually what you do on a standard push-up is you start in that position in the picture, go down, your nose touches the ground, you come back up. One thing I'm assuming here is when you go down to the ground you're not really doing very much work, it's when you move back up that's you're pushing your weight back up to the starting position and that's the work that you're doing. So to calculate the work it's just the newtons times the distance in meters that you moved. The last thing you're supposed to do is record the results of four other students and then calculate the mean. Mean is just another word for average. So on the screen here you can see I have some push-up weights in pounds. Those are like the bathroom scale readings of those students and then the distance in centimeters from their nose to the ground and so you'll have to convert those pounds to newtons and those distances from centimeters to meters to calculate the work required for each of those students to do a push-up. So just kind of review here, our question is, is a push-up the same for everyone? The hypothesis, circle yes if all the results, if you think all the results will be within 5% of the mean or no if any of the results are more than 5% of the mean. So here we'll basically what we'll end up doing is we'll calculate a percent difference compared to the mean and see if any of those values are greater than 5% away from the average work required to do a push-up. In part two of this experiment I have an optional part there on determining the power output but I'll go ahead and calculate that Student number four here completed 10 push-ups in 7.80 seconds. So we can use that to determine their power output. And what you would do is just re multiply their work required to do one push-up by 10, and then you divide that by 7.80 seconds to get their power output in joules per second or watts. So go ahead and pause the CD and Calculate all of your work values, calculate the mean, figure out your percent differences, figure out if the hypothesis is yes or no, and then calculate that power output too. The table that you're going to use to fill in or put your work values for each student, that's on your last page of your lab assignment there. So you can just number the students, you can call it student 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So go ahead and pause the CD, you have all the data that you need to complete this experiment and calculate your results and then turn the CD back on. 
I'm going to show you how to calculate the amount of work. First, you have to take your weight in pounds and convert that to newtons. And you can see here you need two conversion factors to do that. One kilogram per 2.2 pounds, and so the pounds cancel. And then 9.81 newtons per kilogram, you can just use that conversion factor. And if you multiply all of that out, you'd have to do 135 divided by 2.2, and then multiply that answer by 9.81 to get 601.977 newtons. Remember, just put as many decimal places as you can when you're doing calculations. We need this calculation to figure out the work. The work is the force times the distance. So the student moved that force of 601.977. This is student number four move that a distance of 0 0.48 meters in doing one push-up. And so you multiply 601.977 times 0.48, and you get 288.9 joules, newton meters or joules. It's the same unit. One newton meter is the same thing as one joule. Now this is the student that I gave you the data to figure out their power output, how much power they output in doing 10 push-ups. So this student did 10 push-ups in 7.8 seconds, so you would just do 288.9 joules times 10, because let's just assume, that's one thing we're doing here, is assuming that they did the push-up the same every time, so they would have the same amount of work to do each time, divided by 7.8 seconds, and so you get joules per second, and that's watts is the same thing as joules per second, 370.4 watts. So you think about a light bulb in your house light bulbs range from 40 to 100 watts. So this student did 370.4 watts of power output. So if they were hooked up to a generator and that generator was 100% efficient, they could light quite a few light bulbs in the house just by doing push-ups. So just an interesting number there to see the power output abilities of a human. Here are the work values that I calculated for each of those students in joules. And then the mean, the average, for those five students was 258.6 joules to do one push-up. Now, remember our question was, is a push-up the same for everyone? And we were going to say yes or no to that question based on how different the, di the values were compared to the mean. And so, what I would do here is just look at, let's say, student number three. That was a pretty low work output. Actually, that was the lowest one that we have there compared to the mean. All the other ones are actually fairly similar. But we do have to take into account all of our data here. And if we compare that 185.7 to the mean of 258.6, you just do a percent difference. What you do for a percent difference is take the larger of the values that you're comparing, subtract the smaller one from that, that's your difference, divide it by the larger number, and then, of course, multiply that by 100%. And for this, you would get about 28.19%. So that's obviously greater than 5%. So our hypothesis would be no that a push-up is not the same for everyone. For some people, it takes a lot less work for them to do a push-up compared to others. So let's move on to our discussion now. We've shown we have our results, and based on our results, our hypothesis was no, that a push-up is not the same for everyone. 
think about some sources of error, you should pause the CD and try to think of them on your own. And, and that's always what you should do is as, as long as you have all the data for the experiment is try to do everything and then turn the CD back on to see what all the different possible solutions are. So some possible sources of error are that we did not collect enough data. It would be better to have the data for 50 students or 500 students than just five. Any time in science when you want to calculate an average or a mean of something, it's always better to have as much data as possible to make that calculation. Ten or more is usually a good number to shoot for. Another possible error is inaccurate measurement of the distance from the floor to the nose. So that would give you an inaccurate distance measurement. And instrument error, the bathroom scale maybe has error. The ruler itself may not be calibrated exactly correctly. Always instrument error. Anytime you use an instrument, it, it has some error involved with it. And then calculation errors, just calculating the work incorrectly. Okay, so we've done a couple of experiments here on torque and work, and we've seen some of the different laws, and I think these are physical laws that God has put in place to, to make the universe work, and I just think it's very interesting to see that they really do work. And I don't know about you, but just seeing that gives me confidence that God is real and that he cares about us and that he has made this earth with a very specific purpose. He's made us to do very specific and certain things too. And we should always be doing everything we can, reading our Bible, praying, doing whatever we need to so that we know what His will is for our lives. Okay, well that's all for lab number four.